do one thing here. How's that sound, Al? Do you have a soft key on? Nothing? No. We're having a mic issue with some reason. Let me see what's going on up there.
Maybe to like measure 10. Oh, yeah, that's all I get, isn't it? One more time. Thank you.
Well, good morning. You guys may have to try that again. Good morning. We are so glad to see you on this snowy Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us in worship. I'm Pastor Mike, and we want to thank you to those that are watching online as well. We are so thankful we have these chances to worship God together, and I wanted to start with just a few announcements. Of course, the first is, thanks for being here. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here, but also, how can we connect with you? In the pews, you'll find our Connect cards, uh, a great way for you to share information, to ask any questions, or to share prayer concerns with us. You can also text that to our number, 730-4040. It's a great way to reach all of the staff anytime. Uh, and again, we do value prayer so much in the life of this church. Every week at, on Tuesdays at 12.05, we gather all of these prayers together and have our prayer time on Facebook Live. We'll still be doing that the next two weeks as well. Even though the office is closed on Monday and Tuesday this week, Mike is going to try some Facebook magic, and we're going to do our prayer time from various locations. And so we'd love for you to join us with that as well and to share any prayers you have with us also. Also want to remind you that this evening we have our services at 5, 7, and 11 here at the church for Christmas Eve services. The 5 o'clock service will also be live streamed for those who would like to watch it online. 5 o'clock is generally our biggest service as well, so if you want to come to one of the later ones, it would be a little easier to find a seat if you'd like, but we'd love you to come anytime you want. And also just want to remind everyone with the Christmas break, we will, the office will be closed Monday and Tuesday this week. It will be closed Monday the 1st, and we will not have our Wednesday night meal or Wednesday night programs the next two weeks. We'll resume again on January 10th, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. Last, uh, as the new year begins, we are also starting a number of new small groups. The first is called Man Code. It'll be on Monday nights starting January 8th at 7 o'clock. Love for you to join us for that if you'd like. Then on the 27th, Mike is going to be leading a study on Sunday afternoons at 2 called What in the World Am I Here For? Or what on Earth Am I Here For? Really talking about our purpose and our meaning in life. Great study as well. And then that afternoon, we'll also start Financial Peace University at 4 o'clock. FPU is a great program. If you've never taken it before or it's been a while since you have, I promise you that uh, Dave Ramsey's got some great information, no matter what your financial situation, that will help you see through God's eyes what uh, gift our finances are and how it can work for our benefit and his benefit. I think that's all the announcements I have for now, but we are here to worship God, so I'd invite you to stand as you are able. Mike is going to lead us through tonight's call to celebration, part of Mary's Magnificat. Mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the powerful and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has come to the aid of his children. Amen. We're going to continue in our worship by saying, what child is this? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King. Shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring in love the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean and 
true confession. I can claim the biggest face palm in biblical history. Maybe you've done something silly before, and when you look back on it, you just feel silly. You know those terribly embarrassing moments. Like giving a presentation in front of an auditorium only to realize at the end of your speech that your fly was down. Or maybe you've had an entire conversation only to discover when you see your reflection later you had something stuck in between your teeth the whole time. Maybe you're far enough removed from that moment that when you look back on it that you can laugh on it. I'm not there. Not yet. Maybe you got out of the bathroom and checked your phone only to realize that that Instagram Live that you thought you ended 10 minutes ago is still recording. We all have embarrassing moments. I know you're wondering, how can my embarrassing moment be worse than yours? Because I'm the guy who didn't have any room available when the God of the universe was born on that cold night in Bethlehem. Yep, I'm that guy. The no room at the inn guy. The guy who didn't listen to Joseph when he desperately pleaded for room. Wouldn't you know it, his pregnant wife ends up having a baby in my barn. And not just any baby. She gave birth to the most important person in history. Of course, I didn't know at that time. If I knew who this child would become, I would have done things differently. See, it only took some time for it to all make sense. For all the pieces to come together. Years later, when people started popping in to see our little hotel because the word had spread that it was our place where the Messiah was born, you know how they say there's no such thing as bad bad publicity? Trust me, that's not true. I wanted to die of shame or build a time machine and travel back to that night. The Messiah and his family came knocking on my door and I failed to show them hospitality. Not only that, I sent them to the barn behind my inn. Then again, maybe we all have those moments. Moments when we embarrass ourselves. Moments we wish we could take back. Moments we got so busy we missed what God was doing. Maybe, like me, you've been slow to see what God's up to in your life, in your community, and in the world. Trust me, I get it. That's why Christmas is so important. Because the Prince of Peace has come, even if we weren't paying attention. Because that baby, he still wants to bring peace to our lives. Today, I light four candles. The candle of hope. The candle of love. The candle of joy. And the candle of peace. Peace. I like that one. Because God has everything under control. Even if we miss it sometimes. And that's a pretty amazing gift. So I had a hard time this week coming up with the God sighting, and not because God is not at work, but there was a lot of things going on this week, so I couldn't choose, so I didn't. I'm going to say them all. And, well, last week, Sunday, we had our student ministry Christmas party, and the theme was, come dressed as your favorite Christmas movie character. Pastor Mike came dressed as John McClane because he thinks Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It is a Christmas it's, movie. It's, it's not, but I respect your opinion. <laughs> and, you know, I always have fun with the students. It's always nice to get together and we play games and we do a lot of things. But we did something different this time, which was to take some time to pause, listen to the Christmas story, and we took five minutes to meditate, pray, here in the sanctuary, and I don't know if you've ever been in the sanctuary when it's night and the lights are dimmed and you can see our beautiful cross, and we just took a moment to enjoy it all, to enjoy God's presence, and to remember the magnitude of what happened that holy night, and that was my favorite part of the whole night. Uh, I don't know if the students felt the same, but (laughs) it was my favorite part. And then the next day, come Monday, 
uh, or a small group gets together to watch a movie to wrap up uh, our, our Advent small group, Journey to Bethlehem. And we met at Luz House. And while I was there, I remember something that about a year ago, I invited Lou to small groups. And she said something like, um, I don't know if I'm a small group kind of person. And I remember I, that got stuck in my head because I wondered, what kind of person is a small group person? Hmm. And lo and behold, a year later, we're having small group in her house. And that just comes to show we're all small group people. We can all join a small group and make those connections. And believe me, uh, they become strong and they become part of um, your spiritual growth. So that was something I remembered and I thought it was really neat. Here, here it is, this lady who says she might not be a small group person, opening her house to all of us. And lastly, but not least, on Wednesday, we had our Christmas pageant. And among all the chaos uh, that it is to work with kids, trying to calm them down and uh, have them not be so loud or whatever, I noticed that there was a mom here who had never been here before. Uh, her, her daughters have been in our program for more than a year. They've been coming uh, on Wednesdays, but she had never been to church. Uh, and that night was the first time she was here and she was sitting right around here. And I could see the girls were so excited to see their mom here. And they were performing exclusively for her. Like they were just staring at her and doing all the movements. And they were just so happy that she was here. And I was really happy too because during our Christmas pageant, we got to share the gospel. Our Christmas pageant talked about how Jesus was the reason, uh, how he came to save us from our sins and how he died. And the, sh the gospel was shared, and she did not come to listen to the gospel. She came to see her children, but we were able to plant that seed. And now we don't know if that seed will, you know, be fruitful or not. That does not depend on us, and we shouldn't worry about that. What we should worry about is us doing our part on planting and sowing that seed. And you can do that. Uh, with your time, with your gifts, with your offerings. You're always welcome to give. And we leave the rest to the Lord. Amen. Sorry, I always finish like Pastor Mike. <laughs> and that's it. And I'll leave it to Micah. He has something special for us. I felt like Micah because I talk a lot. So, but now... I give it to him. He was. He was ready. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's just find the two corn. You know, I, all right, we're off script. We're a little more intimate here this morning, you know, with the weather and that kind of thing. I'm going to go, I'm going to keep it going. Off script. Because I like to talk like Denise. You know, Denise gives me a little cri- uh, little grief and that kind of thing, and, and I welcome that from Pastor Mike. And, and there's a little culture. I remember it was like two months in, Denise made a comment. She goes, they really like picking on you, meaning you all, the whole church, just they all like picking on you. Little does Denise know, one of the first times I got to perform right before I got that saxophone, um, I had made it to the stage. I was 15 years old freshman in high school and uh, really loved playing my horn and uh, just as much as I do today but the ability wasn't quite there and I had to do it doesn't matter to any of you but it was the fourth movement of the epic sonata and it was a really awesome piece I ended up later doing the full sonata in college and it was great and all of that and it, it was fun but I'm up there at state in front of the judge this young student, they moved me to the grand hall because so many students were coming into the room. And it was great, it was cool, and I totally flopped. Just as Levi was sharing, it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. But the God of peace had spoken and revealed to me. And now what? We often have a choice after embarrassment to, to give up, to not pursue it anymore. Instead, somewhere along the line, Jesus came to the bridge and put people in my life to continue my playing, and now he's doing a bigger and greater work. Sometimes our deepest, most embarrassing or painful moments, God reveals to us in ways that we've never seen in our lives. So, bring on the peace, Lord, because I guarantee you're not ever going to embarrass me more than I did myself that day. But God will use the most embarrassing, painful, hard parts of your life to heal us this morning. So this morning, as we're gathered now, I'm going to invite us into a time of prayer. And I ask you to think about that. Search your heart. What is painful? What is, what is embarrassing? Whatever it is, and hand it to Jesus and ask him how he will use that for his kingdom, for his glory. Let's let's read and search that with Jesus right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning to sing your praises because you are so worthy of every sweet note you have for us. Jesus, we thank you for the many, many ways you're moving in this church, leaving a legacy from children to a mother, helping teenagers set aside their phones and just do five minutes of worship with you. That's amazing. And Jesus, even changing hearts so that you disciple in us and through us in a new way. God, you are so incredibly powerful and you work in the strangest ways. And so this morning, Jesus, we invite that unlikely touch of you. And we ask that you would search our souls, search our hearts. We admit that we need to change. We fall short sometimes. That's not to condemn us. That's not to punish us, even though we deserve it. But that's just to say we need you, which is just another act of worship this morning. Jesus, we want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and to continue to do your work in us and through us as a church. Anoint us, Lord, for your individual glory. God, we thank you for this incredible moment to worship you, to seek your peace, and to continue your work in this church. And it is in that spirit that we pray together the prayer that you taught us long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. I'll invite you to stand as you are able. We're going to continue with another Christmas carol.
Today's scripture lesson is Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from the Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken by Quirinius, was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting the child. Why they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place in the guest room. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas. I have to say, having the kids read scripture may be my favorite new Christmas tradition. There's something amazing about having these young disciples share the word of God, something that, that's so familiar to us in a way that maybe we've never seen it before. I admit I, I'm a bit of a creature of habit, and Christmas has its own traditions that we sometimes love to have. Every family probably has some special Christmas traditions. This one's a little different for us. We're empty nesters now, and so I have one son who's married and one that's in the military. Christmas will look a little different, but I still cling to those pieces of familiarity, those patterns in our lives. Like Sunday afternoons right after church, I go to lunch with my parents every week. Sunday afternoons, I take a nap in my blue chair, and I really like that habit. We have our favorite stores that we shop at or our favorite restaurants that we go to. I have to admit, I've gone to the good life here in town so many times, they know me my name. It's not quite like Cheers with Hey Norm, but it's getting close, right? Of course, if you ever have a negative experience in one of these places, it, it can be hard to go back. I remember years ago, Wendy and I were shopping at a store that we'd gone to many times before, and every time, everything seemed to be going wrong this time. The salesperson just wasn't listening to what we were asking, and they were convinced they needed to sell us something that was better, which of course cost twice as much. And the whole time, there was a manager behind the sales counter on the phone talking to an employee and just ripping them out. It was so awkward and so uncomfortable, I don't think we ever went back. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be our experience. We can hear someone else's bad review and decide that that's reason enough not to go back. I've got a confession to make. I, I think I've done that with this part of the Christmas story. See, for years, I've had a pretty negative perception of this innkeeper. I mean, how in the world could someone tell a pregnant woman, the best that I can offer you is the barn out back? <laughs> it always seems so heartless and cruel. Maybe you've had that picture as well from time to time. Of course, the irony is we, we really know nothing about this innkeeper, even if it's a real person. We we never hear about an innkeeper mentioned in Scripture. We assume the character in the story. And this year I started to wonder if, if maybe this innkeeper had gotten a bad rap. If maybe this person is more of an unlikely hero than a bad manager. Maybe our whole picture of Christmas needs some revisions. 
Today's text starts out with the why behind this family's trip to Bethlehem. We're told that a census is being taken. Now, Luke may have embellished a bit on this story, right? In verse 1 it reads, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Taking a census wasn't an uncommon thing. That's how the Roman Empire collected its taxes. But a census was taken of a region, not of the entire empire or the entire world. Nowhere in any Roman literature do we find a call for an empire-wide sort of census. And also, census was their way of collecting taxes, so it was tied to the land. It would have been odd for someone to pick up from where they lived, from the home they had or the land that they worked, and move somewhere else for the census. I don't know, does that that mean that maybe Joseph owned land or inherited land back in Bethlehem as well? Whatever the case, we we learn about this 90-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I don't know about you, but I've always pictured it as Joseph's walking along, leading a donkey, and Mary's riding along on it. Even our preschool Christmas program this week had a song that they sang about Mary riding along. (laughs) Only there's no mention of a donkey in any of our scriptures. If you think this crazy journey was odd for a nine-month pregnant woman, imagine if she walked the whole 90 miles. And then they get to Bethlehem, and, and I always have this image of it being this rushed thing to try to find a place to stay. Like Mary's water broke as soon as they hit the city limit sign, and, and they had to find a place, any place, for them to have this baby. I wonder if that's an assumption, too. I mean, verse 6 reads, while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. Doesn't say as soon as they got there. It doesn't say immediately. It says while they were there. I wonder if we make the assumption that it must have been rushed because why else would you settle for a manger as the bed for the Messiah? Verse 7, we read it. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and, and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place in the guest room. Now, some translations say that there was no room at the inn, which is where we get this idea of some grouchy innkeeper who tells them no. Only at that day and age, there weren't really hotels, so to speak. And so we're left to wonder, how how did the Messiah come to be born in a barn, or at least in a manger? I mean, maybe Jesus was born outside, maybe Maybe he was born in a cave, which is what many scholars believe today. Or maybe Joseph and Mary just stayed with relatives who were so poor that the animals came inside on the cold nights to sleep. It actually wasn't that uncommon. Whatever the case, Mary and Joseph were a long way from this picture we may have of them staying at some Hilton, right? It it just didn't work that way. Maybe this idea of no room is a misperception as well. I mean, in many Jewish homes, their bedroom, so to speak, was really just a loft that you accessed from a ladder. When it says there was no room in the guest room, maybe that's what they meant. I remember when I was like four, my family took a big vacation trip to the West Coast, and we rented an RV, now, I don't remember a lot of that trip, but I do remember how cool I thought I was because I got to sleep in the loft above the cab, right? It's pretty cool, unless you forget you're in there, and then you try to set up in the middle of the night, and you hit your head. Is that a better picture of the guest room? Maybe it wasn't no room. Maybe it didn't mean a lack of hospitality. Maybe it was a point of practicality. 
Pastor Timothy Atkins Jones writes, when we strip away our assumptions about a mean innkeeper who wouldn't allow Jesus into a motel, we recognize the reason Jesus was born in the family room and placed in the manger is because there was no room in the guest room upstairs. We judge the the image of this innkeeper as rude or callous. We have this picture of hospitality based on what we think should have happened. But we didn't live in their era. <laughs> and we don't even know what was available. I mean, what if this, this gift of a place to stay was the best they could give? What if a makeshift crib made out of a manger was actually a sign of hospitality? The reality is they gave more than anyone else. Think back to a a special gift maybe you've received over the years. Maybe a gift from a a child. (laughs) Chances are it wasn't a memorable gift because of its monetary value. It was about the effort the intent. What if the innkeeper wasn't some villain, but someone who gave their very best, even if it's not what we expected? Unlikely hero in the story. I mean, whatever the case, if it was the next room or or the backyard in the barn, or, or wherever she had this baby, it, it wasn't like it was some secret thing happening. It's not every day a house guest gives birth. So everyone knew what was going on. I don't know, maybe we have it all wrong. <laughs> Pastor Jones goes on to say, instead of emphasizing what wasn't available for the first family as Jesus was about to be born, we should instead magnify the ways that they were provided for. Why do we see the innkeeper as as the villain? (laughs) What if their host turned out to be one of the first to kneel, worship the King of Kings? That first Christmas, it, it was different than what we picture. Our nativity scenes, as beautiful as they may be, are are tainted with assumptions and misunderstandings. The real Christmas, it was was more complicated (laughs) and messy. I wonder if the real meaning of Christmas, the the real point of the story of the Messiah coming to be with us, isn't about the messiness and the imperfections. Would we benefit from seeing the manger not as Jesus somehow being slighted, but as an act of hospitality? As this reminder, we can give our best, even if it's not what the world expects. I don't know, sometimes I think we have a fairy tale picture of Christmas. <laughs> Or a fairy tale picture of, of what our family should be. Maybe a fairy tale picture of what the perfect church is. The thing is, if you're looking to be disappointed, you'll find it every time. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if we can see the beauty in those little moments as well. That's what we look for. Maybe that's what we start to see. Church, I wonder what we might be missing. Where we have made assumptions that have limited our understanding. Not just on the Christmas story, but with our faith. (laughs) The people around us. Do we miss people's kindness and efforts because it wasn't what we expected? (laughs) I don't know. But I'm certain, without a doubt, that this journey God calls us to 
it's going to be a bumpy road. <laughs> and it's certainly not some stay at the Hilton. But maybe, just maybe, we can see the beauty in a simple manger as well. Our life may not always be perfect, <laughs> but it could be such a gift if we're willing to see the amazing in the little moments as well. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we are so thankful. So very thankful for the many gifts that you give us. So thankful that, that we can come and celebrate the birth of the Messiah. But also recognize, God, that it, it wasn't some perfect and pristine moment. God, life is messy. Ministry is messy. And, and sometimes it, it, it feels overwhelming and unexpected. God, I wonder if that's how you always planned it. That the unlikely may be the very places you show up best. God, help us to see the ways we can serve you more. How we can find the beauty in the simplest of things. Because in the midst of it, God, is our chance to see you and to share you with the world. Thank you, God, that, that we can celebrate you even when life gets messy, even when our plans change, even when the routines are broken, even when the weather changes our understanding of what Christmas should be. God, help us to see you in all the messiness. In your name we ask it. Amen. Well, as our time of worship comes to an end this morning, I would invite you to stand for our last song. It's number 238, Angels We Have Heard on High.
as we leave this time and place of worship as we go out into the world, let us remember the gifts that God has given us. We'd love for you to join us again for worship at 5, 7, or 11 tonight. But whatever your Christmas Eve looks like, let me remind you, it may not be perfect. It may not be pristine, but God can use it. Go into the world celebrating the simple mangers that may be so much more than we give them credit for. Merry Christmas. Thank you.